and that is that peculiar, strange, unforced force of the better argument. Habermas believes that much in rationality that we can change our minds if we hear a better argument. And a free person can do that without being ashamed of himself or herself. You know, if you're in a free and equal situation of communication and someone convinces you through a better argument, you go, well, I now believe differently, but not through distortion or anything, but through just that strange force that a person feels when they become convinced. They go, oh, gee, now I agree with that. That is the force that a free human can recognize according to Habermas. Okay, another uh, condition, and these, these are obvious conditions that arise, I mean obvious, that they can, each one can be disputed, and I will discuss philosophers later today who dispute everything I'm saying now. But I, I want to present Habermas's, since I, this is one of my main areas, I want to present his position as powerfully as I can. Habermas also thinks that in various dimensions we try to communicate in certain ways. For example, while we do occasionally lie, it belongs to Habermas to the structure of, say, instrumental reason in the sciences that when we contribute to a discussion on that topic about what's in the world, what entities there are and how they behave, that we try to make our contribution to the conversation one that is true. Now this is the sort of linguistic reformulation of a, of a Kantian postulate. But no, I mean, it, in a way it's a piece of good advice. I mean, uh, if I was to say, I, I, you know, how should you talk? Well, try to be relevant. There's a relevant condi relevancy conditional, you know, built into speech. This is how, I, I mean, I, I, this Habermas gets some of this from grass, and I'm adding a little as I go along. Make your, make your contribution to the conversation relevant. So if you're at Lech Walesa's trade union meeting, don't start discussing Harrison Ford's latest performance compared to Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's not relevant. So try to be relevant. True. Try to, try to make your uh, contribution one that is true. Doesn't mean you will, but try to, try to make one that's true. Uh, another condition built into to this, I, what Habermas has now call, be, begun to call the ideal speech situation the ideal speech situation. Well, why ideal? Well, because he realizes this is an idealization, that human beings won't be able to fully carry this out. But to the extent that we can, we will be engaging in communicative, in communicative reason. Try to be relevant, try to make your contribution one that's true, and see, and this is obvious to me too, try to make your contribution one that's sincere. When I think about that, I always think about an, an article written in philosophy that is a brilliant article that would be praised by all my colleagues, but it ended with the sentence, oh, by the way, I'm only joking. In a way, that one sentence would undo the whole article. I mean, it would be like, no matter how good the article, someone would go, well, what a, what a joke. I mean, this, is a, this guy's a cl No, uh, the, the idea here is that when you contribute to, a, to a, a, what's called a reason conversation, that we expect, humans expect the contribution to be a sincere contribution. <coughs> and uh, let's see, the final one is a moral condition. And that's that we expect that you try to make your contributions to language ones that advance the cause of what is right. Now, there's no theory here of right other than the ones that you've just heard in the communication theory itself. It'd be wrong to be insincere. It would be wrong to, you know, lie. It would be wrong to violate the symmetry condition. It would be wrong and so on. Uh, uh, in, in, in fact, this is a quite thin moral theory. But come to think of it, when we tell our children, look, you ought to do this, what stands behind our ought is something implicit in language. Namely, that our children can depend on us, you know, sincerely telling them a moral truth. This is what, before, you know, earlier when I said we don't learn moral theories from 
philosophers. I didn't mean in this sense Habermas is talking about because we do learn it in this sense. Habermas means that when mothers tell their children or fathers, don't lie, they mean it. They, it's, not, it's not distorted. They mean don't lie or don't whatever. This is, uh, 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 this is the ethical, as it were, dimension of language. Now, he doesn't want us to confuse these various spheres. They all interplay in language. But for Habermas, and this is a, a, a tradition that goes back to Kant, these each represent different practical areas. Science, morality, art, and even religion all represent different value spheres. Each one will have certain conditions that will be much more important in it than in others. In the scientific sphere, truth conditions will be most important. In the ethical sphere, the conditions for what we ought, ought to call rightness or how one ought to behave will be most important. In the aesthetic sphere, sincerity conditions, Abermas says, are important, mainly because he wants everything to fit. I'm not sure that's true about beauty or not. I'm not sure we want the beautiful to also, uh, our communication about it maybe shouldn't even be sincere, but these things need to fit. This is a German theory that needs to fit. Okay. Uh, well, it looks like we've replaced Marx now by ignoring the economy, which wouldn't, wouldn't please any of the coal miners in West Virginia tried to replace it as a way of understanding ourselves in the world. And we have traded in the class struggle, which Marx took to be the, uh, the uh, driving force of history, for Freud's talking cure. Well, there are some obvious uh, criticisms raised by young Turks like myself in the early phase of his work, uh, namely that the class struggle is not uh, psychoanalysis writ large. The reason it's not is because Workers have every reason to believe that their bosses are not prepared to engage in a process of undistorted communication with them. Now, a patient may believe about his analyst or her analyst that, that they're prepared to, especially at those rates. As Freud once said, if you don't pay, you don't get better. But I mean, at those rates, at those rights, uh, you know, uh, you can expect some sincerity and some give and take, but we have no reason to believe the class struggle is a kind of psychoanalysis writ large or that the struggle of human beings over ethnicity or of the struggle of women to find dignity and equality is some kind of an analytic process writ large. Habermas is aware of these objections and responds to them in several ways. Uh, the one that bothers him the most is the following, that his model is elitist, his model of communicative reason, which I have counterposed to all these pathologies to which it is addressed. When I mentioned all those pathologies uh, that, that the young people I know have, and, uh, you know, anomie, in other words, meaninglessness, and anxiety, dread, so on, you mention all of those. Well, those are all systematic distortions of communication that come out in the way they talk and interact, and the theory is addressed at those. But here's the problem. It's not just that this doesn't reconstruct Marxism, which is of little interest if it's not a true and interesting theory of the present age. The deeper problem is that it looks like an elitist theory. It looks like a theory that trades Marx's analysis of society as a giant factory for an analysis by Habermas of society as a giant seminar room. Have you noticed how all these conditions are the ones that ought to hold in a seminar? Everybody in a seminar should be relevant, concise, sincere, and make their contributions true. And it's not lost on any of Habermas's critics that he's spent his whole adult life as a professor. So, 